Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our New Year's Eve Dharma talk. I'm very happy to see so many nationalities, English speaking identities from various countries uh, of the world. And feel free to ask any questions in English uh, as you prefer. I wanted to ask about um, thinking. And we are told here to don't think, put down your thinking, and you will find something more clear, more true. Um, which I believe and I can see. So my question is, so when should we think? When, just in general, outside of the temple, think about stuff, about life? When do you go to the toilet? When I need to. Exactly. When do you think? When I need to. No, all the time. That's the problem. <laughs> Imagine we went to the toilet all the time because it feels good to take a dump or take a leak. We would be really crazy to do that, but... Nobody thinks like that when constantly this cognition machine is rumbling all the time, producing unnecessary things, unrealistic illusions. So make it just like the body. When necessary, think. When not necessary, we don't think. That's why we teach correct situation, correct relationship, correct function. Thinking, just like emotions, is a very good servant, but it's a terrible ruler. What does your thinking serve? Who does your thinking serve? Is there anything higher than just being smart? And most people in the West, they don't think that there's anything higher than just being smart and successful, etc., etc. But once you find that, the Alpha and the Omega, where your thinking comes from and where it goes, you begin to get it. And interestingly enough, Without suffering, there is no enlightenment. Without the burden of cognition, you do not want to go beyond it. You do not want to get rid of it. So you're exactly on the right place where you want to perceive your thinking, what it does, why it does it, where it goes, where it comes from. That's why we keep don't know. At first, we believe that don't know is the lack of information. Because the signal is not coming from your computer. No, actually is the absence of ignorant views. Look at it that way. So when you return to your true nature, which is clear like space, clear like a mirror, you're not missing anything. You just come into a controlling or creative position. And that creative position, when it spontaneously begins to function, produces the necessary amount of thoughts, and it does not produce unnecessary thoughts. Might be hard to believe, but you can actually get there. First, when you attain this point, even for one moment, it doesn't seem to have any relevance to your karma. But then as you get it more and more and more, you may even fall in love with this, and just say, okay, I'm thinking, boom, unnecessary, boom. It's just boom, boom, you know? And then uh, you can get attached to the sweetness of emptiness. That's also thinking. So anything that appears and disappears is name and form. Thinking, emotions, etc., etc. Once you put that down, then your thinking becomes like a good and tamed ox. If you watch the 10 ox herding pictures, and you substitute the ox first with your own karma, as long as it's brown, etc. Then you understand why we have to practice, why it's such a struggle to become clear. Zen is a very direct path to perceive your karma, whether it's cognitive or emotional, willpower, past, present, future, judgmental mind, checking mind, wanting mind, false identities. That's my favorite, false identification gives you the strongest belief. So if you have very strong beliefs, see what you identify with. It goes both ways. Okay? Thinking is great. Without thinking, we would not be humans. But if only thinking controls us, we can be worse than animals. So that's why we attain don't know, attain this clarity, and then thinking can actually help us save all beings from suffering. Uh, I wanted to ask, do we have the power to um, heal our pain and, I don't know, past karma, or 
is it sometimes uh, necessary that we need um, from outside like a help or something? Or is it all in our power to heal everything, all issues that we have? Did you have the power to create that karma? <laughs> I guess, yeah. Then I guess you can also fix it. <laughs> That's good news. <laughs> yeah, sometimes we forget that so much that we need some help. And that's okay. Sometimes those people who are ahead of you 20, 30 years, they can help you a lot. But it doesn't mean they fix it for you. They teach you how to fix it yourself. Your karma, your baby, your job. Very simple. But all alone, in an isolated manner, it doesn't really work. You don't feel the courage. You don't feel the potential. You don't really believe in yourself. Strangely enough, if you really want to believe in yourself, get into some kind of human situation, get into some kind of relationship and try to cooperate slash work together with other human beings. And that gives you individual self-confidence to the necessary and sufficient extent. That's one of the big paradoxes that we have. We carry a bunch of paradoxes as homo sapiens. You know, sapiens means wise. How on earth we got that, I really don't know. We are thinkers, that's for sure. But wisdom, that's actually pretty far down the line. And if we don't practice, then we believe this karma is, exists by itself and it controls us. But to the contrary, our incorrect relationship to that karma is what controls us. You know? You get the correct view you make the correct effort, then you have correct practice, correct livelihood, correct speech, correct action, then you can control your karma. You've just heard a brief outline of the Noble Eightfold Path. So when we practice correctly, then past karma, present karma, future karma, all come back to this moment. And this moment is all we have, but it's everything we have. We don't need anything more. So don't worry about the past. Whatever you need from the past is right here, right now. Also, don't worry about the future because what you need in the future, you create right now. There's only one version of the present and it does not depend on your opinion. It depends on your clarity, whether you notice it, perceive it or not. We all have that power that what we created, we can also handle, dissolve, use and reuse. But do we realize that? Do we come into that? Do we attain that? That is the question. Do you? More practice necessary. <laughs> I work with, with people uh, that comes to me uh, to help them with their suffering. And some of them are in uh, depression. And I find it very difficult um, because when they are in depression it's it's like a cycle it comes back again and again and again they really want help but whenever they see the moment and perceive the moment they dismiss it like as if it has no purpose in earth and still they say that they really want help but they don't stop clinging to their dismissal, to the, to the unmeaning, like the meaning of, th of being here is being without a meaning. How can I help them? Point out their dismissal, because even though you want to help them, they dismiss that too. Or they just suck your energy out, mix it with their depressed karma, and they keep spiraling down. You should actually point the ground where they hit. Don't try to hold them back. Make it faster. You will get to the brink of a self-destructive behavior. You are there now. What do you do? Strangely enough, just like good pilots when they do a gravity dive, before they hit the ground, they pull up. You should have the courage and the care and the expertise to make people do just that. 
Because as long as you keep feeding their depression, they'll go faster and deeper. How do they realize that they are actually in control? They dismiss even that. So it's a negative mania. They keep losing energy. And they keep you losing energy too. So then you depend on their depression. And that's not a good type of dependence. In fact, if you make them realize what it is that makes them depressed, soon they will start to listen because they already heard from you what happens when they hit the ground. And you should tell them you won't stop them. It's their job to decide. You want to hit the ground? You want to go self-destructive? You want to go totally and absolutely nihilistic? Your choice. The moment they feel that it's their choice, everybody wants to live. We have such strong survival instincts, possessive instincts, creative or procreative instincts, that once you activate that, they will pull up the plane. But it takes an enormous amount of courage and sometimes being really sharp and penetrating to do that. And if you have the skills and the courage and the expertise, you can do just that. And it takes time. Sometimes you have to display strength and deep inside your compassion just makes you cry, but you don't display that. You completely feel what they are going through. But you never take their autonomy. Never take their freedom. Just remind them of their own responsibility, therefore their own control. And then after a while, depression stops and they start to come out of it. And the last act is that they find meaning or purpose in life. If you start to, you know, give them some purpose while they are still going down, they'll dismiss that too. For you, for anyone else, it makes perfect sense. That kind of purpose, that kind of meaning. For them, nothing. Not yet. Not yet. When they have this little wind of death and annihilation on their faces, they know they can die. That will make them turn back. Okay? And we talk about only depressed people. We don't talk about suicidal people. That's different. You need a different approach there. Okay? What is the difference between Mahayana and uh, uh, Hinayana? Don't make Theravada and Mahayana. Only practice. That's all. Uh, there's a question somewhere there, but I would like to ask um, more about, if you can tell more about the don't know. I mean, um, like I have a lot of confusion and it's causing me anxiety. And when I'm so confused and I don't really know anything, I don't, I can't decide. I know, I don't know what's right. Everything feels wrong. And um, what can I do about that? Next question. <laughs> you wanted me to tell you about don't know. How can I say anything? So. When you have chaos, when you have some impasse, that means too much thinking, incongruous thinking, disharmonious thinking. In fact, it's not a lack of information, it's this tremendous amount of ignorance that makes us incapable of making clear decisions. All right? So if you have really don't know, then this moment is very clear. Your mind space is infinite. You can see karma coming a mile away. So don't know is very different from confusion or chaos, whatever. Okay? Return to correct experience of don't know. No more chaos. Also, no more bondage of logic and systems. That's the other point. More questions? You said now about um, we... Um keep the no mind, we come back to the moment, we escape the chaos. Um, my question is, escaping the chaos, isn't that... I didn't say escape, you said that. Okay, sure. Why did you say escape? Where did that come from? 
Don't escape from escape. <laughs> Perceive it. Perceive the source of it. It gives you a tremendous amount of information. So, I mean, we're, there is no chaos. So isn't that in some way, are we, I guess the word I'm using is escape. I'm escaping chaos. But um, so when chaos appears, should I try to leave it? Should I, when I come back to the moment, to my Tantian, I feel as if I'm escaping, aren't I? You make it, you have it. You don't make it, you don't have it. Why we teach come back to your Tanjon or Tantian? Because this is the spot, that's the energy state, that's the mental state where you do not differentiate, you don't make dualities. So chaos disappears, also logical structures disappear. All cognition, all emotion, all past, present, future, all disappear. Read the Heart Sutra again. That's the connection. Okay? So you, you cannot escape. Where? There's nowhere to escape. But if you make it, you have it. If you don't make it, you don't have it. So come back to the point before thinking, before creation. And then you have some control, how you think, what you think, etc. But remember, thinking cannot control thinking. Emotions cannot control emotions. You just lose energy. You just get exhausted. You just become disappointed. Okay? Because illusions cannot control illusions. Never. You come back before creation, before making anything, before dualities with the help of your tangent practice, then you attain. I cannot put that into words. Even if I could, I should not. Yours to discover. Hi, Sunim. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I think that being here at uh, Wan Guangsa, it's such a treasure because it's one of the few places that lay people can practice uh, uh, meditation like this. Um, and even though I'm living in Korea, it's uh, rare uh, to be able to practice uh, like this. So in order to be able to make the most of this time that, uh, that I'm here, as well as everyone, what can you give as far as advice for making the most out of the kyolche? Just do the practice. Don't think about anything else. Our format is very clear. The way we practice is set out in an unequivocal and clear and simple manner. As Master Sung San said, only go straight, don't know. Only around, 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 just repeat karma. So that's really not necessary. Keep it simple, keep it clear, and don't think about yourself. Don't think about outside world. Don't think about your previous notions of, of who you were, who you are, who you want to be. And then you can return to this mind, which is our true nature, which is no mind. Yeah, we talk about Buddha nature, but actually Buddha nature was invented by Mahayana Buddhism to give a little candy. Originally, Buddha nature doesn't exist. And that's okay. Somebody asked their master, Nam Chon, mind and Buddha, same or different? And Nam Chon said, mind is Buddha, Buddha is mind. And everybody was very happy. In the monastery, yes, mind is Buddha, Buddha is mind, let's practice, get enlightenment. Few months pass, they asked him, Sir, mind and Buddha, what kind of relationship? He says, no mind, no Buddha. Everybody was, wow, what happened? What changed? They were very disappointed. And they asked him, the master, a few months ago you said, mind and Buddha, Buddha is mind. Why did you say that then? He says, so that the children in the kindergarten wouldn't cry. Okay, so attain this don't know. This don't know has absolutely no concept behind it. No name, no form, no life, no death. There is no way that your thinking or your emotions can actually comprehend that. You can only experience that. That's our huge potential. Now this potential can have a name. It can have methods and history and whatever. But don't cling to anything. Just follow the great way. 
follow the direction of going beyond life and death. That's all we've got. Everything else goes. All your sense of identity, everything that the body has ever experienced through the five senses, when it's over, it's gone. Only your attachments, your identifications, the forced content of your backpack, that goes with you. So have the courage to unpack everything. Lose the backpack. Then you're free. Okay? It's New Year's Eve. But it's solar New Year. The Korean Solnal, Lunar New Year, is still quite a few weeks away. Jewish New Year, also different. The old Roman calendar, the Ab Urbe Condita, that's also different New Year. So where is New Year? When does it begin? When does it end? The sun does not know how many planets we have in the solar system. Sometimes even astronomers have a debate whether we have seven or eight or nine. The planets don't know about their rotation time. We do. We have various ways of reckoning time. We have various ways of measuring space. Where is New Year? The New Year is in our minds. New Year is in our culture. And if you wish, New Year is in our heart. So make every day New Year. Make every moment a new vow. Make every single opportunity a, a precious you know, chance to correct our direction. And then it's worth it. Because when you look back, when you're old, and the whole life you've lived, what did you actually do? I had the chance to converse with a lot of elderly, including my own grandfather, who's long gone. And I remember what he said, what he did shortly before he died at age 84. He only had as a lasting legacy the love of his family. When you get old, everything else is gone. Material possessions, you don't even know anything about that. Desires, all gone. Anger, no use. What do you have in your heart shortly before you depart? That's your legacy. Nothing more. So I want to thank you all for coming together and sharing the Dharma. I hope we can practice more and more in order to attain our true nature and save all beings from suffering, not just in 2018, but also in the infinite number of years beyond that. Thank you very much.